51 years ago, Kenneth Hathclaw bought a local ski and climbing equipment store in San Francisco and began growing it into the global juggernaut known as the North Face. Under his direction as president and CEO, the North Face established its position as the largest, best managed, and most technically advanced company in the sports apparel space, permanently shaping the mountaineering and backpacking industry. Since selling the North Face in 1989, HAP has run numerous companies and launched the international management consult consulting firm HK Consulting, which specializes in strategy, marketing, and sales for sports, apparel, and financial services companies. A true adventurer in life and business, HAP has spoken around the world on branding, leadership, and entrepreneurship, and is the author of two highly acclaimed books, Conquering the North Face, An Adventure in Leadership, and Almost. 12 electric months chasing a Silicon Valley dream. And now let's give a warm welcome to Hap Klopp and his interviewer for today, Nutshell CEO, Joe Malkoon. Hi, Joe. Hey, Hap. How are you? Good, and you? I'm doing really well. It's uh, been a long time. Yes, it has. But uh, <laughs> I didn't want to stay out of the snow there, so. <laughs> I'll be there. When was your last trip to Michigan? Actually, I was there uh, last week. I was up in Grand Rapids, uh, and it was snowy. It was cold. Yeah, we've been getting a lot of snow and record low temperatures. Yeah. So, Hap, um, we met about four or five years ago, as I recall, after uh, a potential investor in Nutshell had introduced us, and I think he was trying to more or less impress us with his uh, network. And he said, oh, I've got this guy, his name's Hap Klopp, and he's the founder of the North Face, and you guys should really meet him. And I remember thinking to myself, yeah, sure. I'm sure he like had some role in the North Face and therefore refers to himself as a founder. But sure enough, we met and you were the founder of the North Face and pretty much became one of the most impactful folks on my early career as a CEO. And through that time that we've known each other, you've taught me so much. And so today I was just hoping we could kind of have a co casual conversation and teach some of the folks who are joining us for Boundless today, some of the things that I've learned along the way. Well, thanks for the kind words. I'm not so sure I was that impactful, but what the heck. <laughs> you've always been extremely generous with your mentorship and that's something I've always really appreciated. Um, so I want to get started just going way back. Uh, it was 1968 and you were just out of Stanford Business School. What were you doing at that time? And like, what was your plan as you were thinking about becoming an entrepreneur? Well, that's a lengthy story. I mean, I thought I knew what I was doing, but uh, uh, more likely I had that NC2A look, no clue at all. Uh, <laughs> as you move forward, what, what happened is I, I've become a serial entrepreneur, but I backed into that. And the way I backed into it was, was rather strange, but uh, bear with me and I'll, I'll take you through it. I w went to Stanford as an undergraduate, and when I was a senior there, my father died, and we had a family company located in Spokane, Washington. And that company made wood windows, frame, sash, and door. And although we put all the windows in the Empire State Building and the Chicago Merchandise Mart and such, we were still quite small relative to the competition. And so while I was a senior, I was flying between Spokane, Washington and Stanford, which is San Francisco. And I was trying to be a student. I was trying to drink my fair share of beer and at the same time trying to run a company. Well, over the course of that senior year, I made an assessment of the company uh, and the assessment was we weren't going to be able to stand up to the competition. If we were going to do it, we were going to have to move the facilities closer to where the uh, wood was that existed because we were getting further and further away. The second thing is we're going to have to invest tens of millions of dollars, which I was going to have to raise to be able to accomplish that. And the third thing was I was going to have to replace the management team, people I'd known my whole life, because they just weren't capable of being competitive in the environment uh, because we were competing with large companies like Warehouser and at that time Boise Cascade and others. So I concluded that the better strategy, uh, given the fact that I was now about 20 years old or whatever, was, was maybe to sell the company. So I applied, got into the Stanford MBA program, which is a two-year program. In the first year of that, I ended up negotiating the sale of the company, running the company, going back and forth between Spokane and, and Stanford, and, and trying to be an MBA. Well, fortunately, uh, I was able to conclude the sale at the end of the first year. And, uh, and so with that in hand, I believed, okay, now 
somebody's going to offer me a job to run their business, right? I'm going to have a Stanford MBA. I've already run a business. You know, who, who, who could deny that? Well, the net result was nobody offered me that job, which was my surprise, but not theirs. So I decided, I decided what I would do is what a lot of MBAs do, and that is basically uh, go work for a large company and look around for an entrepreneurial opportunity. Now, I didn't feel real comfortable with that, first of all, because I had a lot of idiosyncratic ideas that didn't square with big business. I didn't like planned obsolescence. I didn't understand how people could pay women half of what they paid men. I didn't understand why there was discrimination against gays and whatever. You know, why don't you just hire the best people and do it? That was what I was thinking. And what I saw in big business, frankly, was exactly the opposite. But with no job in hand, I decided I'd interview, and I'd interview with large companies that uh, were in sales and marketing, because I thought I had a flair for that. Well, I, I interviewed a number, and the one that sent me into being an entrepreneur was effectively the, the last one I had, which was with Procter & Gamble, located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Procter & Gamble is a big consumer goods company, well-respected for what they were doing. But the interview starts with... Uh, eight hour interviews, one hour with HR department, one hour with everybody, they make an assessment of you and you make an assessment of them. Well, the HR person says to me, is your name Kenneth or is it App? I see both of those on your CV. Uh, and I said, well, it could be either one. Most of my friends call me Hap. And he said, well, when you work here, it'll be Kenneth because uh, nicknames don't give you the gravitas necessary to lead older people. And I'm going, oh, great. I'm feeling even more uncomfortable. And then he goes, in, in the same vein, you need, need to realize you should be wearing a white shirt and a tie. And I was wearing a white shirt and a tie. And besides, there's no productivity analysis that shows white shirts and ties make you any more productive. And, and so I know I'm in the wrong place. And he asked this question every interviewer asks then, which sends me out of the room, but effectively looking up at this guy as if communing with God and saying, you know, if you were to join our organization, where do you envision you'd be in five years? And knowing I was out of there, I said, well, if I were to join Procter & Gamble, and I'd like to underscore the word if, I would expect to be president of Procter & Gamble in five years. And frankly, that means passing you in five minutes, and I don't think that's any big deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, that's a pretty bold way to approach an interview, Hap. I, I, I always get the sense you didn't want the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, the strange thing is they offered me a job. <laughs> Uh, so it says something about the fact that probably what's more important than your CV or your resume is uh, how many job openings they have. But but the net of it, it was a great interview. Uh, it you know I they were talking about most people don't interview you uh, the way they should. They ask you what you want, and then they tell you that's what the company is all about. The reality is he was telling me what it was about, and I was able to assess that that wasn't me. And then concluding that, you know, I can't work for anybody else because with all my idiosyncratic ideas and whatever, uh, I'm, I'm not a good employee. Then, then that sent me to realize that the only thing I could do was basically to start my own business. And I wanted to start about something I knew something about. And frankly, when you're raised in Spokane, Washington, you spend an awful lot of your time out of doors because there aren't okay, a lot so, of it. So you eventually find this store in downtown San Francisco. Correct. What was it about this store, this business? Well, there are a number of things. I'd done a study. I did a little bit of consulting and developed over a course of about a year a plan to launch a brand which was in the outdoor business. My belief was that there was a place for a much better product than the one that existed out there, having experienced being too cold in the wilderness and, and all of those things. And I saw social trends that were happening. The social trends were, people, there was a Vietnam War at that time. There were a lot of people trying to get out of the cities or trying to go back to nature. I coupled all those in, into a business plan. So then what I realized as a, a startup company, we needed a couple of things. One, we, we were going to develop our own product line, but it was going to be a lot more expensive than any other product out, out there uh, because we were going to make a better product. In doing that, I didn't know how long it was going to take for people to get it, to understand. Uh, and so what I needed was a platform which would allow what we called Safeway money to come in every single day. 
Now, I looked around and there were two stores, uh, one in San Francisco and another one that Doug Tompkins and Susie Tompkins had developed that had the name The North Face. So I loved the name The North Face. Uh, they weren't very large. They were doing a total of 300,000, but it could provide us the cash flow that we wanted to be able to be out there. Uh, it had great flair. Uh, Susie and Doug went on to do a spree de corps. They knew how to market things. So I knew that they understood the lifestyle uh, approach. They had had that. We were going to have some cash flow coming in. And I believed what we could do is, is put another store together, make the back half of it our manufacturing, be close to the customers. And, and what I believed at that time, which has actually become uh, now common, but at that time was very unusual, was I believed an omni-channel company was going to be the channel to be out there. I believed you could sell wholesale, sell through your own stores, and at that time, our own catalog later that yeah, morphed, of course. And you didn't have the luxury of the internet, which a lot of these omni-brands have, to, omni-channel brands have today. Right. Yeah. And, and of course, there's a, a plus and a minus there. I mean, the, the, the plus now is everything accelerates so much faster than it did when I was developing the company. We could grow a little bit organically because you didn't have that explosion that you have with the internet. So, so those stores were great. They had the, the influence that we wanted. It allowed us to get some cash flow so that we would stay alive until the unwashed figured out what we were talking about. So on that point, I, I remember some very specific stories you shared with me in the past about I guess, for lack of a better term, just lean uh, practices in terms of marketing and advertising. I remember you telling me a lot about sort of photo shoots on the side of the road, and it ended up really impacting some of the major product decisions that you made as well. Could you share a little bit about um, those, how the product was impacted by the type of marketing you had available to you? Sure. When when I started out, I believed in branding. Uh, I believed in creating a brand, but a brand is not a logo. A brand is not a tagline. A brand is the DNA of your company. And once you figure out the DNA, then you just repeat it consistently, put that out there. People who like what you're doing will collect to you. Brands are like coral. They grow over time. You don't see them growing. Uh, They become very complex. If they're really developed and really consistent, at some point you reach a critical mass that is so unique you have a monopoly and nobody can compete with you. And that's what we were trying to do. And the the way we did it, and we worked with it, and I've worked with other uh, branding people about this, is we came up with three words that reflected what the DNA of our company was. And then laser-like, we focused on them. And the three words that we used uh, were, one, disruption, two, quality, and the third one was triple bottom line. By triple bottom line, I mean an equal commitment to social causes, environmental causes, and profit. So in terms of disruption, what we did was look for a way to stand out by having a better product. We took materials from the Vietnam War and we applied them to general camping. And when we did that, we took aircraft aluminum, made tent poles and pack frames. We took parachute cloth and it made sleeping bags, tent tops, and some really funky clothing. We lightened the load that people carried by 50%. So instead of going 100 feet into the wilderness, they went miles. And then uh, women joined the fray because it wasn't a beast of burden act any longer. And so what we did is disrupt. And then we constantly look for ways to disrupt because we knew disruption would make us stand out as well as make a better product. So when Gore-Tex came along, we were the first to embrace it. It took us into skiing. uh, And then as our tent sales slowed down, I went to a philosopher genius I knew by the name of Buckminster Fuller, who was a discoverer of geodesic domes. And I asked him if he would help us design a tent. He said he'd love to, but he was changing the world. But perhaps if we put a team together, uh, he would mentor the team. Well, we had a lot of Bucky lovers because we were located in Berkeley. Uh, We did it. uh, We developed. We revolutionized the team. So we, we disrupted that way. And then when we, when we disrupted, we went to quality. And how do you make something stand out? Well, it's by being audacious. And what we did with quality is we underscored it by having a lifetime warranty that we dealt with. And so everybody goes, oh, my gosh, you know, they really, it, it positions you with respect to the customer. It tells everybody who's a supplier, a vendor, how they have to work with it. It told our employees with the quality they had to do to be able to build out there. And then we would use storytelling because storytelling gets your message across. And when it's told by seconds and parties and third parties, it has more credibility than if you say it. And of course, in today's age, it gets out there faster with social media and whatever. So we would always find stories. Our first story was about lifetime warranty, but then we would expand beyond that. 
And then when it came to triple bottom line, what we tried to do is develop stories again about our true commitment to doing all three things. From an environmental standpoint, our, our first point was a lifetime warranty makes a better product than even recycled product because it lasts forever. No goes, never goes into landfill. To try to not sound too preachy, because we thought there'd be pushback from his preachy, we came up with a, an award, which we handed out. It was a negative award, but it had humor to it, if you knew it. And we called it the Ice Nine Award. And the Ice Nine Award was based on a book by Kurt Vonnegut, in which the uh, protagonist has this great invention that is wonderful, except it's going to change all of the water in the world into ice. And the scientist knows it's going to destroy the world, but such a great invention, he has to pursue it. Well. We decided that we would give this Ice Nine Award every year in our catalog to the most environmentally destructive group that existed out there. And we gave it to the U.S. Congress one year, and we're getting letters from congressmen's aides. It's amazing how many aides they have that can write you when you do things like this. But the idea, the idea was getting the message out there in a way that made sense. And then we coupled it with when we sent expeditions to the top of Everest, they brought back more trash than they took up there, which was really unique. In terms of triple bottom line, when we got to the social aspect, we decided that we would be the first to do an AIDS awareness campaign because we thought we needed to do something for society and we thought a macho company behind an issue which at that time had some stigma because it was associated with uh, the homosexual world. It wasn't, but that's what people thought. We thought we could help with that. And, and we spoke 14 languages at all times in our factory so we could hire the best workers from wherever they were. And we didn't care about LBQTC. It, it didn't, if you were good, you could come to work for us, and even if you didn't speak English, it's okay. We'd help you get there and do that. So we felt that social part. And, of course, in terms of profitability, none of the people who went to work with me at the beginning had a business background. All incredibly bright, but what I was looking for was passion, passion about the outdoors, passion about making a great product, and, frankly, passion about changing the world because we thought we would do that. And so when we brought them in, I knew my role was to train them about business, which I did. And I, every year we had a two year, two, uh, every two years, we had a long range planning meeting where we bring in outside people to speak, professors and others, and I would speak, and we would teach them about business. And it must have worked fairly well because 11 of the people who worked with me at the outset ended up running other major outdoor companies. Wow. And this is a business background. So, so we, we did all of that. but. But at the outset, and going back to your question, and I'll stop being so garrulous, but uh, stand out by what you do. When the first store opened, we had a band there, and the band played music. The band, the band was called the Grateful Dead. And then the people at the door were the Hells Angels. <laughs> Now, that later went on to, uh, you know, a, a strange combination at Aldemont Pass, but we did that. And then we took advantage of music also because our factory was right next door to the Credence Clearwater Revival. So we would hold things at our factory and next door, Credence Clearwater is playing Proud Mary or what have you. And some of that's serendipity and some of it's not. Right. So, so brand. Well, I mean, yeah, you're clearly ahead of your time in every way, particularly on social issues, um, which must have been a lot of headwind at the time, but nonetheless, you ended up building product that people just fell in love with and a brand that truly was iconic. Um, I recall you sharing a bit of a story with me about some very specific things around color choices and badge placement. Um, yeah. I thought that was really fascinating how sort of like low budget for marketing drove you to make some pretty big decisions around badge placement and color of your products. I don't know if you recall this story specifically, but uh, I think it'd be really fun to share. Well, you got a lot of stories around, but the, the first one to recognize is that because we didn't have any money, we decided to put a logo on our product because our, our best salesman was our product. And so you know, it, it isn't as, as bold as 1-800-GOT-JUNK, but if somebody looked at it, they'd know where they could go to, to get another one. And, and that became very good and very famous. We put it in the obvious place, which was right on the breast, which most people do. And, and so we planned it and we registered the logo as you do. But as I said, a brand is not that logo, even though you need to register and do it properly. But, but we joked at times about the fact, you know, we're, we can probably charge $10 extra just if it has that logo on it. 
We said, well, if that's the case, why don't we put a couple of logos on it? And uh, we were joking, but then there came a reason through serendipity to be able to do that. And what happened was we were trying to look for a way to look really risky, hairy, that was cheap. Uh, to do some photography and some advertisement. What we realized is ice climbing is easy to shoot. There's a place right outside Durango, Colorado in Ure. 10 feet from the side of the road is this huge ice fall that people climb. We could drive up there, shoot a whole shoot, and be back to have beer in the afternoon. So the idea was good, and it wouldn't cost us much. We went up there, shot some photos, took them back, and it was exciting and whatever, but we saw two things. First, one, you couldn't tell uh, anything about it because the blues, which were our famous color, were just totally washed out by the ice. And, and, the, and so we said, okay, yellow, we'll come up with yellow, which is not a commercial color, but we included it in there. We called it Acapulco Gold, but that's that was for inside humor. Uh, but as we then went on, and so we did that, but even then when you shot the photo, the problem was you couldn't see the logo because all the time when you're climbing the, the ice, you're facing the ice. You've got ice crews, and carabiners and pitons and whatever, pitons at that time. And so what we said is we've got to put it on the back of the jacket. And you would normally put it at the neck because that's where it's symmetrical. But everybody who was climbing was using a teardrop shaped pack. And so it would obscure it if you had it on the back. So we decided to put it on the shoulder because then you would see it when it was on the shoulder. And we did, it became an iconic placement. Really now there's only two other companies that place the, the logo there. Uh, one is from Japan, another one, which is super dry. And another one is from uh, Germany, Jack Wolfskin that only puts it on one product. And so through serendipity, we ended up owning that placement on the shoulder. And so now if you're walking down the street, even if you can't quite recognize it, you see that logo on the back shoulder, you think it's North Face. Absolutely. I, I think that's just such a cool story and one of like innovation and, and, and you know, serendipity, like you said, it's just, it's, it's incredible to me how brands and companies, uh, these really deep iconic stories get developed on just sort of happenstance and frankly, sometimes just necessity. And I, I think that's one of the best stories I've ever heard of that being the case. Um, so when I was talking, when I was talking about stories, find stories, that's what we did, and then tell them again, because parables have been used forever. You see them in the Bible, you see them elsewhere, but basically that's how things get conveyed. So if you can, if you can tell those stories, then they get retold. To, to say we're the best or whatever, every company says they're the best, to say we're the largest, we're the smallest, we're the biggest, whatever, that doesn't really rise above that level. But a story that embeds not only facts, but also emotions are the things that people gravitate to. And that's how you create communities. Yeah, I think that's really incredible. And, and you know, one of the ways that we sort of talk about that here at Nutshell, for example, is when we describe our values as a company. And I used to, frankly, be sort of, I don't know, cynical about values because you read the words that companies choose and they tend to sound very similar from one company to the other. Yeah. And then what I realized was that that's because we have limited language to describe the positive attributes of companies, right? But what really differentiates us is not the words, but how we live them and how we discuss right. them. Right. And, and so that's one way in which I think we've really learned that lesson of trying to make sure we use stories to describe really impactful and important things for how we work and who we are. Let, let me give you one story. And it's in uh, one of my books, Conquering the North Face. But it's a story that what we found was we wanted to emphasize the quality. But a problem that we ran into uh, with a lifetime warranty is there are a lot of other people out there that started claiming they had great warranties, but when people went to try to uh, pr get them effected, they were screwed. And so even though our warranty was really righteous, we were being sort of sublimated by what was happening. So we said, okay, we've got to come up with a story, a true story that really shows the lengths we would go to make a customer happy. So what we did was go to our repair department, because if you have a lifetime warranty, you repair or replace. And I always delegated to them, just make the customer happy. Whatever it takes, make them happy. Well, Aisha, who ran that budget, uh, was there one day. And people came in, they said, listen, we've been planning our trip uh, all year long, and our tent has failed. 
if it's failed, we can't go and it's going to ruin our trip. And she's, well, no problem. We fix them. We've got capacity. They said, we're going out this weekend. She said, we can get it done by this weekend. And, and they said, but there, there's one little problem. And she said, well, what's that problem? They said, well, it's not your tent. It's your competitor's tent. And she said, well, we know them. They make great tents. They make good product. We know how to fix them. We'll fix it for you. And they said, well, you know, what, what's it going to cost? And they said, we don't charge for repairs. And so she fixed it and they went out. Now, those people may have been scamming us or may not have been, but that's the lengths we would go. Well, by telling that story and getting it retold and retold, it really spoke to the quality level we had. It spoke to the relationship we had with the customers. It spoke to what we believed about. And, and anyway, that's, that's just a, a way of doing it. But if you can find those stories inside your company, those are unique to you. When I talked about that, that coral that develops uniquely, nobody else is going to have the Aisha story. And, and that's part of what makes you incredibly unique. Yeah, here at Nutshell, uh, we call it Mad Props. And uh, we have a Slack channel um, where whenever anybody gets positive feedback from the customer, our customers about you know going above and beyond or doing something great or the product in general, helping in a way that was um, exceptional, we share that with the whole team and then we tweet it out. And frankly speaking, every time the Mad Props channel lights up with a notification in our office, you can feel the whole team just kind of like sit up a little bit higher. And it's, it's just awesome. We love that. That's great. Um, switching gears a little bit. Um, I spoke earlier about the fact that you've been a tremendous impact on my career and, and a mentor to me. I'm curious about who your mentors were when you were coming up early in your career. Well, there, there were really three. I mean, actually, there's probably hundreds if you think about it. <laughs> Fair you enough. Know, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about you know, selling a product or making a product. I mean, I, I was in you know, beer drinking and woodworking and whatever, and now I'm going to sell a product. But, you know, so you hire in people that have sold products their whole life. That's that's pretty educational. But but the three that really pivotal that that stand out, one was in branding, one was in finance, and one was in design. In branding, our first chairman was a, a gentleman by the name of Dick Solomon. And Dick was the father of some people I went to school with. Dick was the founder of Lam Von Charles of the Ritz Cosmetics. And he was also uh, the head of Vidal Sassoon and Yves Saint Laurent. And he, he didn't know anything about the outdoors, nor did he care much about the outdoors, but he knew a lot about branding and he knew the touch points. And so just in reacting with him and talking with him about these things, it really helped me. I knew I wanted to develop a brand, but I had to uh, work on the, the language, the nomenclature, the way to get it done, the way to how you do it without spending a fortune. Because most people think, well, you build a brand by spending fortunes. We didn't have the money to do that nor do I think that's most effective. The, the second person who really helped me with finance and also helped our team because that's how we educated them because we were very strict on budgeting. Uh, we would do comparison to budgets monthly. Review, he and I would review with each of our managers their budget, performance against budget, what was going to happen for the rest of the year, how we forecast. And that was a guy by the name of Clyde Skeen. And Clyde was the, uh, the head of the virtual division of Boeing. And he had also been a CFO of a public company. And, and he, he was a great guy, uh, great golfer and whatever. But, you know, his, he really knew finance. He had a Harvard MBA, but he, he had sort of a folksy way. You'd never know it until he finally, uh, he, over beers, I think, told me that one time. And then the third one, of course, with respect to design, and the impact design can have on society and the importance of that was Buckminster Fuller. And Buckminster Fuller, for those who haven't had the pleasure of seeing the things he's done, should look him up online. He, he was a philosopher, a genius, created a Dymaxian car that was better than any car that existed in the marketplace. He had an idea of converting the aircraft industry into housing called the Wichita Housing Experiments. He came up with a new math, which was better than the existing math. And that's how he could construct geodesic domes, which became the only physical structure that the larger it got, the stronger it got. Every other one gets weak. Think of the churches in Europe with the flying buttresses. They need to do that to make it stronger. Uh, and so in talking to him about design and ideas and how those can influence society. Uh, so all of those were really pivotal in what I did and their, their generosity in sharing with me, both their ideas and their execution were integral to uh, the success of, of the North Face and, and my own personal advancement. Wow. 
the thing I love about your stories, Hap, is that the minor characters tend to like also be in these incredible, like successful and luminous people. It's always fun to hear about those <laughs> stories. Um, one, so changing gears, you've sort of been out of the business for a while now, and I know you've been involved with a, a lot of really incredible projects. What, what gets you excited nowadays? What are the types of projects that you get most excited to work on now? Well, of course, it's always the people. I mean, it starts with the people. Uh, the people are what makes it fun. The people are what can make the difference. I mean, the, the only thing that doesn't have an, uh, a limited markup in business, frankly, is people. There's an infinite markup. A good idea, somebody excited, they can, they can make uh, something into a value that you can't imagine. So, so always look for that. The second thing, going back to what we did at North Face, and which I think I'm particularly skilled at, is dealing with disruption. Disruption across a variety of industries, whether it's software, uh, digital, uh, all has the same sort of pattern, same sort of problems that you deal with. How do you forecast the future? You know, what, what's the product adoption cycle? Uh, all of those things. And so I know a lot about that, and I think I can share and give back in that area. And then the, the third one is because I'm biased this way, but is there a branding opportunity? Now, the reality is, as a brander, I think there's branding opportunity in everything, which is probably not valid, but, but can you do something that way to create a viable long-term uh, business? And I think in today's world, a lot of people are saying, well, Amazon is here, so everything's going to become transactional. I, I would argue, to the contrary, that the way you get out of it being a transactional world is by having a brand. Absent any brand, absent any story around what you're doing, the default is always to price. However, if you can point out how unique you are because you've created this brand, then you have an annuity for the future. That makes a ton of sense. I completely get it. Um, so I know that the people listening right now all want to be better business leaders. They want to sell more of their company's product. Uh, they want to establish an incredible brand, or maybe they want to start something new and be an entrepreneur. I was hoping we could sort of extract from you some free advice on how to sort of take the next step. What are the things to be daring about? And what would you share with our listeners right now, or our participants, on how they move into being the next great thing in their career? Well, I'll give you a couple of the axioms I have that I, I try to share when I'm consulting. I try to share when I speak. Uh, and and I, I've learned those. I have gray hair, and there's a reason I have gray hair. Uh, and it's not just age, I can assure you. Uh, the first one is don't confuse planning and strategy with execution. Execution almost always wins. If large companies bring in people like McKinsey and Bain and whatever, and, and they come up with these exotic solutions to things. In fact, they're so exotic, three-dimensional and whatever, the only people in the world who could possibly manage it are themselves. <laughs> in real world, you have you know, people who are normal people trying to execute company. Simplify it. Make it easy to execute and you'll win. The second thing is avoid perfection paralysis. We're in a time of an accelerating pace of change in society, and there's no time for perfect information. I think Voltaire was the one that said, perfect is the enemy of good. Well, the reality is that's where we are right now. Don't wait around for it to be perfect, because if you do, the competition is going to be there before you are. There's that old joke about the two guys in the wilderness, and they're there, and a bear comes out chasing them, and one sits down and, and starts lacing up his running shoes, and the other one goes, what are you doing? You can't outrun the bear. And his response is, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And that's what it is in business. The third one, and this is, this is really valuable, I believe, it always takes twice as long and costs three times as much as you think. So plan that in terms of your cash. If you've got investors, don't overpromise what you can do. It, it, there's an adoption cycle, product adoption cycles, an S-curve. All, all these things can be explained, but the reality is it does. And I've thought when I consult with companies, I can get them around that. But there are so many ways they can screw it up, even when they do what I did, that it does take twice as long and costs three times as much. And what I firmly believed is the next one, and that is it's value, not price, the customer is looking for. If you don't explain the value, then price will be the default. 
But if you understand the market and the customer, that's great. The next one is keep your plans flexible because the only constant is change and change creates opportunity. For example, we talked about the logo, the serendipitous logo on the shoulder. That was, that was just a change. It was from what we were doing. Uh, we could have just dismissed it or we could have complained and said, well, it doesn't work. Now we came up with a way to ultimately became part of the whole lexicon of North Face. Uh, I totally believe in differentiating everything you do. There's 500,000 registered brand names in the world. And if you think you're going to rise above that with an advertising budget that's minuscule, it ain't going to happen. So what you have to do is differentiate because that by itself gets you noticed. And whatever you can do, whether it's the way you do business, your strategy, or the look of your product, or the look of your service, or the ease of something, differentiate. And this one is very valuable. I figured out how to motivate employees. And that is hire motivated employees. <laughs> how do you test for that? <laughs> you, you, you do it by finding out if they have a passion. Uh, yeah, you, I think you can't fair. interview anybody anymore with all the legal ramifications. And a person would be a fool to give you a bad uh, resume because you just go online and you pull the resumes up. You got spell check so they don't make the errors there. So what I do is just sit down and talk with people and riff across things that should be of interest. I love sports, so sports a topic. I like food. You know, you can, food could be a topic. Music can be a topic. Travel can be a topic. You know, saving the world can be a topic. If you go through about five of those and no, no light comes on on the other side, you know that person isn't going to be motivated about anything. And they certainly, you, then the challenge is just converting them to your business message. But first you have to have somebody who really is motivated. That's and an then, incredible point. So basically finding someone who already has the hard wiring of passion, right. that is sort of the basis then of bringing them into the team and making them passionate about what their work is. Right. And, let, and that the, last, the last one I'll give you is, is a quote from somebody, uh, Goethe, who's a German philosopher. And, and what he said was, and I'm paraphrasing, I believe, but he said, whatever you can do or believe you can, begin it. Because beginnings have genius and power and magic in it. How many times have we all sat around with somebody talking about, well, I'm going to do this, I'm thinking about doing this, and it never happens. They start something, they may not know where it's going to go, but the moment they start, there's this spark out there that really gets all things firing. Yeah, oh, that's incredible, Hap. I really, uh, I really admire all of those axioms, and I'm going to make you write them down for me, I think, next. Um, so I think we're actually sort of running up at the end of our session here. I'm going to check with the team here to see if we have any questions for you, which I imagine we do. And maybe we can get a couple answered. Thank you so much, Hap. We are um, at time, but um, the response from everyone online and everyone in the office here. We all have hearts in our eyes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Such a pleasure to have you on the virtual stage. Well, thank you. Pat, great speaking with you. I'll catch up with you personally soon enough, okay? Great, Joe. Good to see Thanks you again. Take care.